Hello everyone, welcome back. We are in the 10th module. Uh, our topic is Meta Model Based Reliability Analysis and today we are going to discuss Stochastic Response Surface Method. Now in the last module, we discussed in detail how we can use least square approximation and its weighted version and also we demonstrated how we can use response surface to replace the original limit state. We also discussed in detail why we need response surface or meta models. The reason is when we have implicit performance function, then we cannot differentiate those performance function with respect to the random variables and that is the reason gradient based reliability analysis cannot be adapted for those cases. Although there is a numerical a way to solve the problem using numerical estimation of gradients, but again numerical estimation has its own issues and that is the reason we need more robust technique. This actually motivated us to construct the response surface and in the last class we discussed how to construct response surface and what are the support points, then how to adopt least square technique for that purpose and then what are the R square value, adjusted R square values and how we can improve the performance of least square using a weight function. So these all mathematical tools we discussed in the last class and also using algebraic polynomial we solved some problem to see how it works for reliability analysis. And during that time we use mostly quadratic polynomials and in that quadratic framework we used polynomials having cross terms or without cross terms. The moment we have or orthogonal polynomials, because of the nature of this polynomial, we get the advantage of orthogonality and that reduces the computational cost to some extent. That is the motivation behind the use of these orthogonal polynomials and also we discussed in detail how to construct the orthogonal polynomials that is done by a technique called grams mid orthogonalization. So, we define a function say f i x which we expect it to be orthogonal. Now this orthogonal polynomial f i x which is valid within an interval a to b and having a leading term x to the power i. Then obviously it starts with a seed so f not x that is the first function of this series of orthogonal polynomials. So f not x is we assume it to be 1. And then obviously our task is to find out the next orthogonal polynomial, so f1x. And as per our definition, the leading term will be x to the power i and in this case i equal to 1 and therefore the leading term in this case will be x. So the polynomial will have this form. So it will start with x that is the leading term plus k1, 0 which is a constant times f not x. Obviously, this k10 defines the orthogonality between f1x and f0x. That is how this notation is written. Now, the moment we claim that k1, 0 is the constant that defines the orthogonality, obviously, we can apply the orthogonality relation between f1x and f0x. Now, if you do that, we get this expression. Now, if two functions f1x and f0x, if they are orthogonal, that means they are orthogonal with respect to some weight function wx and product of this when integrated over the complete domain leads to 0. Now, in this format, if we put the expression of f1x which we already have here, that is x plus k1, 0 f0x. So, if we put this expression back here in this uh, orthogonality relation, then we get what is there on the right hand side. Obviously, when we equate this right hand side to 0, then we get the expression for the scalar constant that is k1, 0. Now, you can see we integrate this function over the complete domain in both numerator and denominator and then we get the constant k1, 0. The moment we evaluate k1, 0, then we can write down the expression for f1x in closed form. So, the f1x is equal to x minus this uh, expression for orthogonality. Now, in a similar fashion, we can actually find out f2x also 
and in this case again the leading term is x to the power i i equal to 2 so in this case x square is the leading term so we get the expression as x square plus k 2 comma 0 f not x plus k 1 2 comma 1 f 1 x and again in this case k 2 comma 0 defines the orthogonality between f 2 and f not and k 2 comma 1 defines the orthogonality between f 2 and f 1. So, now if we apply that, we get again uh, the relations. So, k2, 0 we can evaluate first using the orthogonality relation and then similarly we can also make f2 orthogonal to f1 and that will give us the last expression that is k2, 1. Now, the moment we have these two scalar constants evaluated, then we can write down the expression for f2, x. Now, this is the way gram smith orthogonalization works and using this relation, we can actually develop all the polynomials in this series. Now, if we write down this orthogonal polynomial in this format, where again x to the power i is the leading term and you can see the scalar constants are k i comma 0. This i stands for the function on the left hand side. So, it is the ith uh, orthogonal function. Obviously, this k i comma 0 correlates this f i with f naught. So, it defines the orthogonality relation between f i and f naught. Similarly, k i comma 1 defines the orthogonality relation between i and f 1. The same way it goes on and again, if we apply the orthogonality, we basically get this scalar constant, which is now on your screen. Now, by changing i, you can develop all the scalars constants and you can find out the complete set of orthogonal function. Obviously, in this uh, development of orthogonal functions, what we need to set first is the weight function because the orthogonality relationship is defined in terms of the weight functions. Then the interval over which these functions are valid and finally, it starts with a seed and once we define the seed, then using these three information, we can one by one construct all the orthogonal polynomials. Now, uh, in the last class we showed you, because of this orthogonality relationship, we can directly find out the unknown coefficients of our response surface. It is straightforward, there will be no off-diagonal terms because of this property of orthogonality. Now, uh, again, let us quickly brush up what we discussed earlier. So, if we start with a function which is valid in an interval minus 1 to plus 1 and our weight function wx equal to 1, then obviously we can construct the orthogonal polynomials. So, the first uh, scalar constant k1 comma 0 will come 0, which we discussed in detail in the last class. Obviously, if 1x will be x, then if we repeat the same exercise, f 2 x will have this format and obviously, we can also evaluate k 2 comma 0 and k 2 comma 1. In this case, k 2 comma 0 is minus 1 third and k 2 comma 1 is 0. So, therefore, we can write the expression of a 2 x which is x square minus 1 third. Similarly, if you continue that exercise, then you will get k3, 0, which is again 0, 3, 1 is minus 3 by 5 and 3, 2 is again 0. Then, uh, we get the f3x and that is how we develop the polynomial, what we call Legendre polynomial. Now, it looks like this and also I uh, gave you a home task to verify the orthogonality relation between this once we derive the expression. Uh, I hope you have already done it. It is a simple exercise. Through that only we have constructed this constant. So, you can easily cross verify it. I leave that exercise again with you. Uh, please do it yourself and verify the relation. Now, the question is, instead of algebraic polynomial, we can use this orthogonal polynomials. So, we if we use these orthogonal polynomials, and if we use say pth order, 
it is defined as a set of polynomials of order p which are orthogonal to all polynomials of order p minus 1. Now, this set of orthogonal polynomials, uh, it is having an infinite series, but for all practical purpose, when we use this polynomial for response surface construction, obviously, we again truncate the series after certain terms. Now, there are different orthogonal polynomials also exist in the market, but all of them are convergent in mean square sense. So, this is the most important property of the orthogonal polynomials. The question is, how can we construct these pieces? Now, as we progress, you will see the more uh, and more terms we include, we have uh, the orthogonality relations defined with respect to all lower order terms. And that is the reason as we keep on increasing the terms, we will see that it will have a large number of terms also. Although we have on one hand the advantage of orthogonality, but on the other hand, we have multiple terms that will appear as we keep on increasing orthogonal polynomials in the series. That is the reason we have to make a balance. We have to get the advantage of orthogonality. At the same time, we cannot unnecessarily have large number of terms when we construct the response surface. The reason is the more we have unnecessary terms which are not contributing to the convergence, then that may cause numerical troubles. And in fact, as we keep on increasing the number of polynomials in the series, uh, you can see, you will see actually that the uh, number of components of functions increases abruptly. And also the scalar coefficient that we have just derived using Gram-Smith orthogonalizations. And that is the reason sometimes we call it polynomial chaos simply because as we keep on increasing the terms, we have large number of terms. And many uh, cases, unnecessary terms actually cause numerical trouble and also the computational cost. So, a proper balance has to be maintained. And that is what we are going to discuss how we can actually keep that balance and what should be the mathematical basis for the construction of response surface using PC. Now, all the PCs, again, we start with the 0th polynomial, what we call seed. Normally, we select it to be 1. And then consequently, the first order polynomials are constructed in a way that it is orthogonal to uh, 1 order less. That means the inner product with respect to a weight function is 0. Similarly, we actually construct higher order polynomials and once we do that, at least the polynomial is ready with respect to some weight function. And depending upon the choice of PC, there can be two approaches the way we construct. So, when we start with a limit surface, it has all the random variables and as we progress, you will see sometimes there is a function of random variables also there. So, we can replace all these random variables using uh, orthogonal polynomials. That is the first approach and then construct the limit state in terms of these orthogonal polynomials. In the second approach, we use a transformation technique wherein uh, the variables in a sub functions which are transformed and that complete set is replaced by a orthogonal polynomial. That also is possible because uh, it is always up to us how we are going to construct this uh, um, response surface using these orthogonal polynomials. Now, you can see the list of orthogonal polynomials. This is not exhaustive, but at least some of the most popular um, orthogonal polynomials often used in different analysis. Out of that, the first one we are going to discuss in our um, course here. So, we will use Hermite polynomials uh, because of very specific reasons that I am going to discuss in a minute. So, when you have a Hermite polynomial, uh, this uh, the event space Z, it actually spanned by an orthogonal set of random Gaussian variables. And the moment uh, um, uh, we say Gaussian random variable, 
uh, with uh, zero mean unit standard deviation you can easily correlate with our standard approach in reliability analysis where the reliability index is actually defined in the standard normal space and that's the reason actually we get a direct advantage of using uh, Hermite polynomials uh, to transform the limit state straight away into standard normal space. Now this was first uh, introduced by Ghanem and Spanos. Uh, I will share this uh, mm. reference at the end of this uh, lecture series. So using this uh, we can replace the random variables and then uh, also sometimes uh, sub functions that constructs the limit state. Now if we write down the multidimensional Hermite polynomial chaos, uh, the expression looks like this and you can easily sense that as we increase the number of terms, this summation increases because these are multidimensional. And that is the reason the term chaos comes because the fourth term will have uh, one more extra summations and another term will come here and that is how it will continue. Now, if we just quickly look at the Hermite polynomials, as we change the order of the polynomial, you can see the shape of this polynomial. So, if you can increase the order, you will get different shapes. But all these uh, polynomials, for example, if you consider order 5, it is orthogonal to all lower order polynomials. And that is how it is constructed using a weight function, then a support and a seed. So, now uh, this uh, Hermite polynomial of order p in terms of Gaussian random variables uh, can be used to construct the response surface. The only task is to find out this constant. You can now identify this A0, A1, AI1, AI1, AI2 and so on and so forth. These are basically the projection coefficients of these functions over these orthogonal functions and that is how it works. Now, this expression we can write down in a compact form in this format and the moment we do that, we can easily identify or correlate with the previous uh, meta model that we used using algebraic polynomial where we used least square technique to find out these coefficients. Now, in this case again, ci um, are basically the constants having all those defined at the first expression. And then um, this uh, Hermite polynomial is defined by this expression where this subscript P defines the order. Now, in this uh, representation, if you see, we have order of the Hermite polynomial and the dimension. And once you said that the Hermite polynomial of uh, any given order and dimension can be expressed by this compact form. So, this uh, definition of polynomial chaos uh, actually uh, has the orthogonality, inbuilt orthogonality, which uh, is the basis for the generation of this Hermite polynomial. So, uh, that is the orthogonality relation. So, when i equal to j, then only you will have the right hand side or otherwise it will be 0 because that is how this uh, mm. defined by this Kronecker delta. Now, <coughs> let us just quickly revisit the inner product when we actually talk about orthogonality. So, if you have two functions with respect to uh, some weight, uh, the orthogonality is re relation is defined by this way and that is how uh, we construct the orthogonal polynomial with respect to weight functions. And for the Hermite polynomial, we have this is the weight function in the generic form. So, the first order Hermite polynomial looks like this one. So, we have A0 plus summation of Ai Zi. Then second order looks like this. And that way it continues. So, the third order polynomial and then fourth order polynomial. And the moment we hit fourth order polynomial, you can see the number of terms. Uh, it increases so much and that is the reason uh, we call it uh, polynomial chaos. Now, if we just uh, revisit 
one dimensional polynomial chaos as a special case just to see how this uh, orthogonal polynomials are used to construct the response surface it will be much easier because uh, now the function is in 1d so if we have a function say fx that we want to replace with the orthogonal polynomials where hermite polynomial is the basis so 1d hermite polynomial uh, has this compact form now obviously in this representation our a vector is the constant and then this is the basis vector that we get from the representation using hermite polynomial now our task is to find out this constant a k and the moment we do that we can actually replace this original function using this representation by hermite polynomial so now again the first uh, order I mean 0th order hermite polynomial that is the seed is in this case again 1 and then for hermite polynomial we can define this uh, recursive relation this is very handy to generate all higher order polynomials from the um, seed and that is what we are going to use to generate uh, hermite polynomials. So obviously the derivative of hermite polynomial is of this form this is also very handy uh, to obtain all lower order polynomials from the pth order hermite polynomial now this relation if we substitute back in the previous expression so we get this uh, expression which actually we discussed earlier when we talked about uh, hermite polynomial so Now, this equation, if you look at, it actually relates the first and second derivative of Hermite polynomial. And uh, these properties of 1D Hermite polynomials are exploited to, I mean, combine it with first order reliability analysis that we are going to see in a minute how we can apply this uh, to uh, replicate the limit surface. And once we do that, we can actually go for uh, first order reliability analysis. So, Reliability index evaluation using PC in form, uh, it can uh, lead to satisfactory results, particularly for cases where we have uh, implicit response surface, that means uh, conventional gradient based uh, algorithm does not work. That we will see also some of the examples we will see in this uh, lecture series, where I will show you uh, that uh, there are cases where. Uh, gradient based algorithm will not work now for actual problem when we have a limit surface normally those limit surface are highly nonlinear and often non algebraic so when we have non algebraic limit states uh, they also introduce a highly nonlinear component in the limit surface and that's that causes serious trouble in gradient based algorithm uh, and there we can use this uh, orthogonal polynomials to represent that function. So, this is the symbolic representation of a original limit state using uh, uh, orthogonal polynomials and here you can see this random variables can be replaced by orthogonal polynomials or sometimes as we progress we will see a function of these random variables are also replaced by uh, uh, function hx uh, of basic random variables so mm, that we'll show you in a minute now in these type of cases where we have highly nonlinear uh, limit state uh, convergence is a major issue and to overcome that polynomial chaos is formed now in this approach uh, first we will show you 1d pc um, then uh, using that we will uh, replicate the function and then we will solve some problem now the use of polynomial chaos expansion directly converts these random variables into standard normal space which i have already discussed and the advantage of why we use hermite polynomials 
because uh, we get a limit state which is converted into standard normal space and there uh, we can apply the definition of reliability index to find out the optimal distance and also the MPP or design point. So, if we see how it works, then in a PC based form involves these following steps. So, it starts with the identification of functions and variables to be substituted by PC, that is the first task. The next task is extremely important, determine the order of PC because I have already shown you that if we increase the number of terms in the uh, polynomial chaos expansion, at times it can become computationally really challenging and that itself will introduce a lot of unnecessary error in the estimation. So, determination of the order is extremely important. We need to have the order that is sufficient to accurately model the variables or the response surface. In fact, for that purpose, we can use R square or more precisely adjusted R square to check whether the model is uh, a good replica of the original limit surface or not. Then once we determine the order of PC, the next term is to determine the coefficients of PC. That is even more important because once we construct the coefficient of PC, then we can replicate the original limit surface in terms of those coefficients. Now, if you recall, when we discussed uh, algebraic polynomial based response surface, then we use some support points and based on those support points, we first solve the limit state function and then using those information, we solve for this unknown coefficients in step 3. Now, there can be two approach if we have exactly same number of equations that many unknowns we have, then we can solve it in closed form and then just by matrix inversion or otherwise if we have more number of support points then we adopt regression technique to find out these coefficients. So, either of them uh, can be adopted to solve these coefficients. Depending upon the problem we have, uh, we can select either the direct matrix inversion or uh, regression analysis to find out the optimal coefficients. Now, in this uh, step, support point generation is extremely important. If you recall, last time when we had a quadratic polynomial without any cross term, the number of coefficients was 2n plus 1. And that is how uh, we actually developed the support points ba based on this logic that we have 2n plus 1 coefficients. So, mean plus minus k sigma was the logic. That is how we developed support points. And that time we uh, informed you that there are different other support point generation scheme. As we progress in this course, you will see that also. Now, once the correlation, uh, sorry, the coefficients are determined, then the next task is just to evaluate the optimal distance in the reduced space. Now, once we have the meta model ready, then on top of meta model, we can apply different techniques. We can go for um, gradient based approach. We can go for simulation based approach. Sometimes MCS is much easier because we have the limit surface in closed form. It is just to identify the number of uh, I mean points which are in the failure domain and then using that information we can invoke the conventional definition of probability to estimate the probability of failure. So, these different options in fact we can use other techniques also for example, Latin hypercube sampling or importance sampling all these techniques can be adapted once the response surface is ready after this step 3. So, in step 4 we basically find out the optimal distance in the reduced space and for that analysis we can either use form or MCS. <coughs> in fact, uh, because we have now a functional form of the limit state, we can easily go for second order approximation of reliability. Because uh, the moment these coefficients are ready, we can now evaluate the curvature and if that 
significantly affects the estimation of beta, then at the design point, we can go for the corrections due to curvature. So, these are the basic steps when we use PC based form for reliability analysis. Out of that, again, up to first to third, actually, the steps that involves the development of response surface using orthogonal polynomials. Step 4 and step 5 is just the solution based on the response surface that we develop in these three steps. Now, the question is identification of functions or variables to be substituted by PC that that is the first step and here again the first step is to identify these functions that should be replaced by 1D PC. Generally trigonometric functions, complex algebraic functions or combinations, uh, both of them may be replaced as the situation arises. So, this I will explain as we progress, but first whatever the random variables we have that we uh, replace with this uh, PC and then um, in order to implement form, these variables in the transformed or reduced space um, in case of uh, non-normal random variables, we use equivalent normalizations also and the, using this transformed uh, limit state, then we actually solve for this first order reliability analysis. Now, obviously, in case of correlated random variables, the way we uncorrelated them earlier using eigen analysis, we follow the same procedure and then we first uncorrelate and then uh, use the definition of PC to construct the response surface. Now, the question is how to determine the order of PC. Now, once we identify the random variables or functions to be replaced by PC, then what we do? We just start with a appropriate order and then we check the convergence. So, a lower order PC will result in erroneous approximation obviously and of course, uh, if we just go for higher order blindly, then that also can increase the computational cost. So, that is the reason we iteratively find out the optimal order of the PC that will be sufficient to replicate the random variables or a function. So, that is the reason we start with a assumed order first and then uh, we evaluate the PC coefficients and then <coughs> once they are evaluated, then we compare the PDF or uh, CDF to make sure uh, whether they have converged or not. Now, the main task in this process is the determination of PC coefficients. These unknown coefficients which I have already shown you are basically the projection coefficients of PC and then it can be solved using regression or least square curve fitting. And there actually we need uh, depending upon the type of analysis, whether we go for regression or uh, exact matrix inversion, then uh, uh, we need the support points. Number of support points actually will dictate which uh, technique we are going to use. As we progress, we will see that. But the relation between this random variable in the original space, say xi, and the reduced space, in this case, it is the z space that is zi is through this relation and this relation is known to us because we have used this multiple times. Even in case of Nataf model, if you recall, we use the same relation to convert x space into z space. Now, in this case, capital phi is the CDF of the standard normal variable and f is the CDF associated with the function or the random variable that we try to replace. Now, the coefficient can be uh, solved using matrix operation. So, if you recall, this is the uh, model that we use in case of least square. So, to is estimate this a, that is the unknown coefficient, we take this inversion of uh, this uh, matrix and then uh, multiply that with the right, right hand side and then that is how we get the constant 
vectors which are unknown. Now, in case of 1D Hermite polynomials, we know this uh, right hand side you see, you, you, we know it completely because we know the basis vectors and we know the limit surface that is solved at the support points. So, once we do that, then the optimal distance evaluation comes into picture because the unknown coefficient actually gives us the complete description of the limit surface and then uh, using that we can construct the meta model and on top of that meta model we can solve the reliability problem that is a straightforward case so we have this uh, response surface in terms of the hermite polynomials as many random variables we have so that many we have to replace so in the reduced space we have this definition of the limit surface and then uh, there we use the pth order hermite polynomial and that comes from this uh, uh, relation so we have this response surface now ready so once we have it then using uh, this derivative of the pth order hermite polynomial we can actually differentiate this limit state with respect to the random variables and then uh, we can solve for mm. beta so this equation is known to us it comes from the asopher lind definition if we go for gradient based reliability analysis so our task is to estimate this gradients of the uh, response surface now in this case you see it is not the g of z but g of uh, these uh, hermite polynomials that actually uh, construct the response surface. Now, uh, we can also find out the new design point using this expression and if you recall this is nothing but the uh, newton Raphson algorithm that we use to uh, get the new design point from the initial design point. And then in this process we need this gradient uh, vector estimation that can be also carried out using this relation. So, that is how the original limit surface actually is replaced by um, Hermite polynomials and using Hermite polynomials we can now complete that exercise. Now, obviously this is the way we actually apply first order reliability method using PCE, but once you have the response surface ready you can adopt any other technique sometimes this gradient estimation is also time consuming so that's the reason uh, we can go for monte carlo simulations or other advanced simulation technique that we have discussed now this is the algorithm that we use uh, for uh, pce based uh, meta modeling so we start with the random variables and then we assume a order then we evaluate the PC coefficients, then we check for this uh, fit, if it completely maps the CDF or not. If no, then we increase the order, repeat the same procedure until and unless we see the convergence and once that is achieved, then we have the meta model ready and that we can use form, sum or any other version of reliability analysis. So, that is the flowchart. Now, next comes the support point generation. So, this is the most crucial part of uh, numerical replications of uh, this limit surface. So, we have this multi-dimensional uh, Hermite polynomial chaos. So, that can be uh, represented in this comp compact form where this A vector is the unknown coefficient vector and it is multiplied with this basis formed by the Hermite polynomials. Now, if we use collocation method, then uh, we first identify the order of the polynomial that we are going to use in this meta model construction. Then we take one order higher polynomial and the roots of one order higher polynomial actually sets the collocation points. This I will explain in a minute. So, if we have the Hermite polynomial, so the first order polynomial is like this, then second order, then third order then fourth order and fifth order. So, you can see the roots of these polynomials which are fixed. Now, these roots 
are actually the basis of constructing the collocation points for uh, this estimation of unknown coefficients. Now, obviously, the moment we use one order higher polynomials and um, the roots of one order higher polynomials, obviously, if we make a complete combination of all these roots, we will always have more number of support points than the number of unknowns we have in this uh, uh, meta model. So, let us start with an example. So, in this example, uh, in this lecture, actually, we are going to solve two different examples. The first one is uh, where we have a retaining wall. So, in civil engineering, very often we deal with uh, retaining wall or similar uh, designs. So, let us cons consider this example of a retaining wall. So, you can see the retaining wall and then obviously, the backfill is also having a surcharge load of Q. So, now this retaining wall actually can fail in different mode. Out of that, we are going to study the stability of the retaining wall against overturning failure. So, the moment these loads are applied, actually there are different ways it can, it can fail, it can slide actually, but we will consider the overturning at this point and we will develop the PCE based uh, solution for this problem. And if you go through all the steps, then you can take any other failure and corresponding limit surface, you can actually replicate using PC. Now, to simplify this analysis, uh, we consider the groundwater table is below the base. So, we do not consider for the timing, but of course, you can top up the equations with the effect of uh, groundwater. But for the time being, we assume this uh, water table below this, um, below the base of the retaining wall. Then capital H is the height of the retaining wall. Ts is the thickness of the stem. Capital B is the width of the base. Tb is the thickness of the base. And Bs is the distance from the center line to the I mean, infill side of the base. So, that is marked here. Now, once we have this, uh, the performance function against overturning is given by this expression. Now, in this expression, you can see Gx is Mr minus M0. So, this Mr is the moment of resistance minus M0 is basically the applied moment. So, the moment our applied moment crosses the limit of resisting moment, there is a possibility of overturning. Now, our task is to first quantify this stabilizing moment Mr and M0 in terms of all component forces acting on this structure. Now, obviously, you can sense that this is a problem where we have a limit state which is uh, implicit in nature because we are yet to write down the expressions of MR and M0 in terms of its basic random variables. That we will do in a minute. Now, this wall backfill system, we actually subdivide it into four parts. You can see they are also marked 1, 2, 3 and 4 to actually evaluate the forces acting uh, from different segments of this uh, structural element, right. So, the vertical load due to this each component acting towards gravity uh, that we will identify and these are given by these expressions. Uh, we are not going to explain them because they are self-explanatory. All of you, uh, I am sure you are having background in civil engineering. So, you can evaluate these forces and based on that also, you can actually calculate the moment. That we will do in a minute. But these are the forces acting vertically downward and they will contribute to the moment at the two. Now, in this expressions of this vertical loads W1, W2, W3 and W4, 
we have these constants so ws wc and q are the unit weight of soil unit weight of concrete and surcharge load capital w1 is the weight due to mass of soil you can see the mass of backfill then w2 is the weight of the stem then w3 is the weight of this base slab and W4 is weight due to surcharge load on soil. Now the total vertical load WT is given by the summation of all these four components. And then our task is to find out the resisting moment that we can easily do because we have already identified the loads and we can also identify the lever arm and that's how we can actually calculate the moment of resistance now the moments m1 m2 m3 and m4 are basically due to the vertical uh, loads w1 w2 w3 and w4 and the total mw moment mw due to the weight of the different components of the wall you can get by summing them up so all these components we have identified so we get mw and then we can calculate the distance between heel and the point of action of the total weight w t and then based on that uh, we can find out this lever arm now the total resisting moment uh, we can now estimate mr will be capital W times B minus this XW that is the lever up. So that is the moment of resistance and you can see uh, this moment of resistance has all uh, contributions from different structural components. Then active earth pr pressure is acting you can see the uh, active pressure shown at an angle of delta which is evaluated using Coulomb earth pressure theory. So, the active earth pressure on the wall is given by this expression where this K subscript A is the active earth pressure coefficient and that is given by this expression. Here you have phi, alpha and delta. These are the three angles. Now, obviously alpha and gamma are the angle of the wall and the inclination of the backfill respectively. So that is how we calculate this earth pressure coefficient and that is when we uh, apply in the previous expression we get the active earth pressure. Now the wall is assumed to be vertical and that is the reason the resultant pressure acts on the vertical face uh, at an angle equal to the wall friction and at a height h by 3 from the base. Now once we combine all this and then we get the overturning moment because of this active earth pressure. So that is the expression for overturning moment and then finally when we combine this MR and M0 we get basically the limit surface. So that is how we construct the limit surface for this case and obviously now we have to solve the reliability problem and for that we consider two different cases and in this uh, problem statement we have altogether five random variables as you can see on your screen. Now, in case one, we consider all variables to be normal and then case two, all variables to be not normal and obviously Q, phi and delta, they are log normal, the remaining variables are normal. And their sample mean and coefficient of variations are also given. So accordingly, we will solve the problem using PCE. So that is the task. Now in this case, obviously, if I repeat once more, Q is the surcharge load, delta is the wall friction angle, WS is the unit weight of soil, phi is the soil friction angle and WC is the unit weight of concrete. All these are random variable in our reliability analysis. So in this problem, you see the moment we identify these random variables, there are other functions. For example, the moment we consider this delta, 
that is the wall, wall friction as a random variable. So, in this case, its mean is 10 degree with a coefficient of variation of 7 percent. Obviously, cos delta, this is that itself is a random variable. So, we can consider this as a random variable and then we can replace these complete functions with the help of uh, polynomial chaos. So, uh, the way we actually construct the meta model, it's up to us which variable uh, we will replace by which function. In this case, again, I repeat, we use Hermite polynomials. So, we have identified all the random variables and the functions. For example, this Ka, if you look at the expression of Ka, obviously, it has uh, the constituent random variables. So, that itself now becomes a random variable. Okay, so first we check the convergence. So we uh, select the order of PC and then based on that we compare the PDF as you can see on your screen. Then using the PC we map these random variables and their definitions are written here. For example, this surcharge load that is replaced by a PC of suitable order and with that we actually replicate this function. Then once we do that, we then construct the unknown coefficients. We consider case 1 where all variables are normal and then the moment we construct unknown coefficients and the meta model itself, we can solve for reliability analysis. So, for the reliability analysis, then again we set first B, capital B to be 1.8 and then we vary the height. So, that is how we get this first plot where you can see we solve this using MCS, then we compare the form PC, that means we construct the meta model using polynomial chaos and then on top of that we apply first order reliability method. Then we go for second order corrections and that uh, we compare, but in this case the result shows that the second order correction does not contribute much. So, we compare the results and that is how we conclude that. Uh, the results also match closely when we have v equal to 1.8 and we vary the height. Now, obviously, as the reliability index increases, so we have uh, less and less failure probability. So, in this region, you can see uh, solving MCS is computationally costly. However, still we can solve the reliability problem using PC based representation of the limit surface. Similarly, we repeat the same exercise where we fix the height and then we change the width of the base and then we repeat the same procedure and find out the reliability index beta using three different methods. First again, PC based form. So, we construct the meta model using PC where Hermite polynomials is used and then on top of that we apply first order reliability method. We repeat the same exercise, continue the curvature corrections and then finally MCS and then compare the results. Again, in this case, you can see the results are closely matching. That means that our uh, PC-based representation of the limit surface is uh, satisfactory. Then, uh, we repeat the same exercise and um, in this case, we find out the probability of failure where we keep the B first to be 1.8 meter and then we change the height. Similarly, we again repeat the same exercise where we keep the height constant at 4 meter and change B. Now, obviously, uh, in a design case, you can also find out the probability of failure for different uh, H and B. That also you have studied and obviously, we get this probability of failure surface. So, that surface tells us uh, the level of reliability when we fix the height and the width of the uh, base. So, from this uh, as a designer, we can find out what will be the probability of failure and then for a given height, we can select the base to achieve a certain probability of failure. So, that completes the design of this retaining wall when we consider uncertainty in our design. And in this process, again, you see we have uh, used PC based representation of this limit state which is inherently uh, implicit and of course, the moment we try to solve this, 
using gradient based approach we cannot differentiate this function simply because they are not in closed form uh, but using pc based approach we can easily and satisfactorily solve this problem at least that is what is demonstrated by this result and this three dimensional plot actually completes the um, problem so for the designer they need this uh, complete variation of probability of failure for different values of height and base so given the definition of probability now they can design and find out the reliability of the retaining wall satisfactorily so this is for first case where we have um, all variables are normal then we repeat the same exercise where we have some variables are non-normal sorry some of them are non-normal in this case and then we again the repeat the same exercise where we first keep b constant vary h and then we keep h constant vary b and find out the reliability index using the same methodology that we discussed in the last case last uh, problem then we again uh, find out the probability of failure and see its variation for different values of height and base and then finally we combine them to find out the response again in this case uh, the contribution of curvature is not very high and that's the reason you can see the second order correction actually uh, falls exactly on the uh, first order reliability estimation however that only we can conclude once we solve the problem and make sure that the results has converged when we compare that with the mcs uh, before we conclude anything so that actually gives the complete idea how we can solve this type of retaining wall design considering the uncertainty which is obviously there we cannot avoid them now in our second problem we extend again uh, the logic for infinite slope stability problem so in this case we have a slope as you can see so there is a rock on top of that there is a soil layer and then obviously there is a chance of uh, sliding the soil mass down and that causes the um, slope stability problem now for this analysis again we consider a partially submerged cohesion less granular soil slope of course you can extend the same logic for any other uh, slope stability problem you have now the height of this soil mass the vertical height is capital h inclination angle is theta and the submerged height is small h now one assumption is there uh, that this water table is uh, is shown here so water table is assumed to be uniformly varying over the height of the soil due to the influence of pore water pressure the effective weight of the soil mass decreases and therefore the total effective weight of the soil mass of slope per unit width and the length that we can evaluate and that's what you have it here now in this expression again we have uh, these parameters gamma gamma w and gamma sat these are the unit weight of moist soil water and saturated soil now once we set this definition we can uh, estimate the shear force due to component weight acting on the normal to the slope provides resisting against sliding and the component weight along the slope obviously that is causing the sliding now the moment we estimate these two the force that is resisting and force that is causing sliding so we have these two expression then once we have this uh, obviously in this set of equations we have phi that is the soil friction angle and it is assumed that the soil contains 20 percent soil moisture then void ratio is defined by small e as usual and the specific gravity capital gs of the soil they are assumed to be uniformly distributed and the expression for unit weight of soil and saturated soils are given so again in these expressions we have the random variables obviously the void ratio small e 
unit specific gravity capital gs soil friction angle phi inclination angle of the slope and the submerged height of soil these are the random variables in our uh, problem definition and obviously the final expression for gx is actually in this format now you can see in this format uh, we have all other uh, components here so if we differentiate this with respect to uh, constituent random variables we have difficulties here we have also the trigonometric functions now in this case again what we do we use pc based construction of the uh, response surface so that's the definition of the random variables along with their statistics and then uh, we use uh, both form and sum again in this case so the water table it has been assumed at a constant height from the rock surface that is uh, in this case this height is shown is uh, vertical height is small h the uncertainty in the level of water table has been modeled using a uniform random variable cu such that height of water table capital sorry small h is equal to u times uh, capital h so the soil friction uh, angle we keep it at 35 with the variations and then we carry out the reliability analysis so in this case again we start with the mapping of pc so we identify all these random variables that we are going to replace with the help of pc and then we compare the um, pdf and once we do that then again we repeat the same exercise find out beta for different uh, theta that is the angle of this slope and then for different beta again we estimate the uh, the reliability index and compare it with three different techniques that we earlier also discussed so we compare the results obtained from mcs then pc based meta model and form and then on top of that once we do the second order correction in this case also again the curvature correction is not contributing much so you can see uh, one estimate is uh, closely matching with the other so all three uh, actually tells us that our estimate for reliability is uh, accurate so we then find out the probability of failure for different theta and then again we compare the results for the complete range and that gives us clear idea how this uh, slope is going to affect the um, stability and what is the associated probability of failure or reliability index then we repeat the same exercise and find out for uh, probability of failure how does it vary with theta and phi and then we repeat the same exercise uh, with uh, second order uh, corrections now in this case again as i said that um, curvature corrections uh, it does not contribute much so the results that we obtain from first order reliability analysis of course on top of uh, polynomial chaos based response surface that matches closely uh, uh, with the monte carlo simulation and then we can use that value for design so this clearly shows how we can uh, use orthogonal polynomials for the construction of response surface and once we have that how we can use them for reliability estimation with that our discussion on srsm ends here thank you very much